Hi, I'm Tom Gilson, Associate Editor for the Against the Grain, and I'm here at the Charleston Conference at the Francis Marion Hotel in the Penthouse Suites, and I'm here with Jack Montgomery, who is the Collection Development Librarian at Western Kentucky University, and we're here to interview Kathleen Fitzpatrick, who is the Director of Scholarly Communications for the Modern Language Association. Kathleen, it's a delight to have you with it's us. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for asking. Welcome. Me. Uh, you currently serve as the Director of Scholarly Communications uh, for the MLA, mm -hmm. and that, that sounds like such a cool job. What exactly, <laughs> what exactly do you do? It is a pretty great job. Um, so the, the Office of Scholarly Communication was created by the Executive Council of the MLA in 2011 mm -hmm. um, as a means of thinking about the changes that were taking place across scholarly communication, and particularly how they relate to scholarly societies. So it brought together the existing book publishing program and the web editorial functions. And so part of what we're thinking about is um, the, the projects that have been and will continue to be books. Um, what forms should they circulate in? On what platforms? What are the ways that, that scholars want to interact with books or book-like content these days? But the other part of our, our mandate has to do with thinking about the new sorts of platforms um, that our members are communicating directly mm -hmm. with one another on and are sharing their work with the world on, and how we can support and facilitate them in the process of, of doing that kind of work. Mm -hmm. so, so we're thinking both about the born digital in that sense awesome. and about the digital future of things that have previously been print. Based on that, Kathleen, what do you see as the key challenges that are faced by scholar societies in the current environment? You know, what do you see as their real needs and mm -hmm. the? I mean, there are several challenges that I think are not that different from a whole lot of the challenges that are being faced across the higher education spectrum um, these days. There are challenges with respect to um, shifting technologies and how business models have to change in response to them. For instance, um, scholarly societies, I think. Um, you know, as as we heard in a talk mm -hmm. earlier today, um, have have traditionally rested on three basic forms of support: um, support from members through membership dues, um, support from attendees at annual mm -hmm. conferences or conventions, and support from subscribing libraries um, for publications. Mm -hmm. And thinking about how those three different forms of support are shifting um, and how the future sustainability of scholarly societies um, will develop in a new technological regime, I think, is, is, a, is a very large challenge. Sure. You know, we, we like, like university presses and like libraries, have long been staffed in order to support a print-based communication program. And now we're really, we're having to rethink all of our workflows. Mm -hmm. um, as well as the, the the basic values that we are there to support, what to to really think um, down the road, not just to what our what our members need from us today, but what they're going to need from us five years from now, um, what they're going to need from us ten years from now, so you're really as a support organization, yourself. absolutely, and that process mm -hmm. of constant <coughs> re redefinition, mm -hmm. um, I think, is is one of our prime challenges. Mm -hmm. And that's something libraries are confronting as well. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. Speaking of which, I mean, speaking of libraries, what can libraries do other than subscribe mm -hmm. to support scholarly societies? Libraries, I think, have the potential to become key collaborators um, for, with scholarly societies mm -hmm. as they embark on this, mm -hmm. on this reinvention. Um, scholarly societies, you know, my, my own, for instance, um, are, are many of them very interested in establishing, um, for instance, disciplinary repositories um, where members could deposit the work that they've been doing at the convention or in various publications or their data or what have you. Um, but but we don't have the skill set within the organization as it stands right now to support mm -hmm. um, and to maintain such a, a sort of large scale project. Mm -hmm. Libraries obviously have a great deal of talent um, in, in thinking through their experiences with institutional repositories. Mm -hmm. We think that there might be some room for real robust collaborations between libraries and societies mm -hmm. in thinking about how those models might best serve the needs of scholars going forward. How would you see that? What would be your vision of that kind of collaboration? Uh, again, with their 
thousands of libraries throughout the country. Absolutely, How would absolutely. We collaborate with the NLA. Um, that is an open question and one that I would really love to discuss with library-based organizations, um, whether it's ARL or ACRL or ALA or you know, I'm, I'm not sure which organization would be the place to begin that conversation, but to really think about how, whether it's an individual library or a consortium of libraries, um, might team up with scholarly society or societies in order to support these new kinds of, of, of endeavors. Um, it would be really exciting. Yeah, it sounds like what, um, what role do you see uh, for the university presses like Purdue or Amherst Press in scholarly publishing? Is it changing? Is it is it redefining itself? Absolutely, or? absolutely. I mean, I think there is this entirely new landscape in the intersections of libraries and university presses that's beginning to take shape now um, in a range of different relationships. I mean, there, there are some university publishing um, um, presses or other sorts of publishing mm -hmm. outfits that are entirely contained within libraries um, and mm -hmm. are seamlessly part of that library structure. And then there are others where the press remains somewhat independent and yet reports up through the library, right? The, 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 they're, they're part of the library's administrative structure. And thinking about um, what those relationships can can bear, how how the two different cultures of presses and libraries might learn from one another um, in in pursuit of the institution's common mission, mm -hmm. right? That that if if the mission of the university is the the creation and dissemination of new knowledge, um, libraries and presses have historically served that mission quite right. differently. And to think about them as being two two related points in the flow of information mm -hmm. through the institution, I think um, is is potentially productive. Oh, you're even hearing talk of libraries as publishers. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely, more and more. And I think um, libraries um, stand to learn a great deal from presses and from, from both the, mm -hmm. the successes and the struggles mm -hmm. that presses have faced um, in, in their um, work in disseminating scholarship. Uh, presses also stand to learn a great deal from libraries in terms of thinking about um, the ways that information is best managed and moved. Um, so I think uh, there's, there, there are a lot of fruitful conversations to be had there. It seems like we're natural collaborators. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Let's change tack a little bit. Um, peer review has been in the news a good bit lately. Yeah. Uh, John Bohannon, uh, sting operation on open access journals that was published mm -hmm. in, uh, in in Science. Uh, I was kind of wondering what your take is on that. You know, I think um, peer review is ripe for revolution right now. I think we are, we are looking at a, a, the potential for real transformation in our peer review processes. Um, it, it presented in part because of the ability of the open web to self-correct in ways that closed peer review processes mm -hmm. cannot, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, yes, uh, John Bohannon runs this sting operation on these open review, uh, uh, open access journals and discovers that they're not really doing adequate, you know, or at least some subset of them aren't doing adequate peer review. But there are also, I mean, some really quite notable cases of journals that are doing mm -hmm. really thorough peer review where there have been very public um, retractions of articles mm -hmm. required mm -hmm. based on on determining that the results of the articles were not verifiable and not repeatable. Um, so I think you know the, the, those those cases have mostly been uncovered um, by open communication on the internet. It's mm -hmm. been um, some someone who has sat down with the economics data set and realized that this does not add mm -hmm. up, or that an equation has been improperly applied. Or, and I think if we can find ways within the publishing community to take advantage of the best of um, the, the the wisdom of the crowd. Um, while mm -hmm. still maintaining a certain sense of, of standards and of um, the, the, the really important experience and judgment mm -hmm. that scholars bring to bear on right. one another's work. Um, I think that, that we can actually create a process that will serve us all much better. I, see. Yeah. I noticed you are a proponent of open peer review. I am. Peer-to-peer -peer review. 
And in fact, you've had some personal experience mm -hmm. uh, in regards to your book, Planned Obsolescence. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. Um, so Planned Obsolescence um, was published by NYU Press in 2011. Um, but in 2009, we released the full draft manuscript online at Media Commons mm -hmm. Press for open discussion. Um, in part because I was I was making this argument in the book about open peer review and the things that it might do for scholarly communication. And so I wanted to sort of put at least my metaphorical money where my mouth was <laughs> and see what would happen, you know, if we opened up the manuscript in this way. And so, you know, we posted the entire thing. And in the nine months after um, the process began, um, something on the order of 45 commenters left a total of 295 comments on it. Um, and, you know, it, it got, it attracted a tremendous amount of notice. There were, you know, 20 articles that were written about it on various websites around the internet. Mm -hmm. um, it, the book, the draft process was included um, in uh, like four or five graduate seminars as part of their work, you know, long before mm -hmm. the printed sure. object ever came out. And the, the things that were most important for me in this open review process um, had to do with the fact that, first of all, I had a social context for understanding the comments that were being made on the manuscript. I, I, I didn't ask reviewers to leave their names, but they did. They, mm. Most of them chose to use their, to sign their reviews with their real names. Because of that, I knew um, particularly when a librarian colleague was commenting on the library chapter, um, that I should pay particular attention um, to to that response um, and and so forth. I knew I knew how to read and interpret those comments in a way that, with anonymous reviews, it's not always clear. Um, I also had reviewers able to discuss the text with one another and sometimes disagree with one another um, about their opinions. And so it, it added this, this extra layer to the social context for these reviews in that I was able to see sometimes a particular opinion was just one person's idiosyncratic idea and sometimes, in fact, it was reinforced by the next reader who came along and said, yes, I agree with that and I think you also need to deal with this problem. Um, so so I was able to get a better sense of, of, of what was a general issue and what was just someone's mm -hmm. reading. Mm -hmm. And I also, I mean, just based on the fact that there were 45 readers, I got a much wider range of responses. Um, and from um, a, a range of readers who would never have been consulted, you know, my librarian colleagues would never have been asked to peer review this manuscript. And yet they formed an absolutely crucial community for it. So um, I, I, I was very, very pleased with the process. The one thing that it did not do, that I wish that it had been able to do a little bit better, um, was provide the kind of holistic overview comment um, on the manuscript as a whole. You know, mm -hmm. traditional peer reviewers in, in, a, in a traditional process when they're sent the manuscript will comment not just on everything that needs fixing, but also everything mm -hmm. that's working quite well. And they'll comment on the overall structure and the order of the chapters. And you get this very holistic sense of how the manuscript as an mm -hmm. overall narrative mm -hmm. is working. Um, and here in, in our process, the comments tended to be much more local and targeted. Um, and because of that, there, you know, uh, chapter four, the library chapter, um, attracted very little comment, um, in part because it was a long manuscript and some people didn't get all the way through it, in mm -hmm. part because it was the most technical. Um, but there were places where there are no comments for paragraphs and paragraphs, and I have no idea if that meant that everything was fine. Mm -hmm or if that meant uh, that things were so wrong no one wanted to say, <laughs> <laughs> or what. And so thinking about how we can build a process that can provide the best of both worlds, or, th or how we can mm -hmm. provide a hybrid process right. that can use closed review um, for certain kinds of objects or at certain moments in a process while taking advantage of the, the robustness of mm -hmm. open review as well, is I think where we would like to head. Did, do I understand that you actually edited your manuscript Based yes. On the oh, absolutely, absolutely, and in fact, several of the comments um, were incorporated into the manuscript as either citations, or you know, either I cite mm -hmm. them um, at crucial moments, or I've quoted from some of them directly. They were extraordinarily helpful um, in the process of revising, and and the the book mm -hmm. as printed would not be anywhere near as good as it is mm -hmm. um, without that process. 
So there was a final version of the of the book. Yes, the there. So I, I revised it. We published the the print object in uh -huh. 2011. The the electronic is still there. That draft in that state um, is still online and able to be coming? read. Are people still coming? Every so that? often, um, I, I can tell somebody has assigned it to their graduate seminar or something. Students mm -hmm. will come in and make some comments. Mm -hmm. So um, there's still a little bit of discussion going on there. But you know there are some some kind of complications that this whole process has raised. I, I've never known quite whether to think of the print book as the version of record, mm -hmm. um, or if it's in fact a second edition because the other one still exists. Right. That's, um, inter that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. So it's it 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 begins to change a little bit our notion mm -hmm. of what publication consists mm -hmm. of. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I think I think that's and that's what's one of the challenges I think. I, absolutely, of, yeah. absolutely. Um, you are uh, one of the co-founders of the Media Commons Press. Yes. And if I'm not mistaken, you all received a grant from the Mellon Foundation to do we a did. best practices yes. uh, evaluation. Absolutely. Can you tell us uh, what, what the results of that was? So this was a, a grant that we received jointly with NYU Press um, to, to study best practices in open review and to, to kind of get a sense of the landscape of mm -hmm. what's going on now um, and what ought to, to happen. Um, the, the funny thing is that in the process of conducting this study, we kept opening up more and more questions and coming to fewer and fewer answers. And so what we finally ended up doing um, in the final white paper that we published, um, which went through an open review process um, on, on this study, was to help communities of practice um, come up with the right questions to ask themselves in order to articulate what their purposes mm -hmm. for peer review are, what values mm -hmm. they bring to it, what standards they're seeking to uphold, and then get to what mechanisms might best help them mm -hmm. in, in uh, creating an environment in which they can, can establish those standards and mm -hmm. enforce them. Um, we, we figured out that, for instance, we weren't going to be able to make a declaration on whether whether anonymity or pseudonymity is acceptable in the yeah. process, because for some communities it's extremely important. For other communities, it might be important at certain moments in time or for certain segments of the population, um, but not across the board. And other communities might insist on anonymity all the time and have very mm -hmm. principled reasons for doing so. Mm -hmm. And so I think you know us just simply opening up the question for a community to ask itself, why anonymity? Mm -hmm. um, or why not anonymity? Right. What, what is the end goal? Um, and what, what decision about identi identifying reviewers um, is the best mm -hmm. one for that community to reach that and goal? And it sounds like it would be discipline discipline specific. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, different disciplines bring very, very different values and standards mm -hmm. to the peer review process, and they use it for entirely different purposes. Mm -hmm. And so there just simply couldn't be any one size fits all set of best practices. Um, mm -hmm. And so we ended up, as I say, with more questions than answers. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, it was quite productive. I noticed this morning several times you mentioned the MLA Commons. Yes. I, I, was, I, I was sitting there thinking, I wonder what that is. Can mm. you tell us? Absolutely. So um, the MLA Commons is a, a scholar to scholar network um, that is hosted by the MLA um, that provides a platform on which our members can um, join groups, hold discussions in those groups, can collaborate on projects, can create blogs, can publish and share their mm -hmm. own work, and a whole slew of other things besides. Um, so it's, it's um, a, a network that is um, membership oriented. Um, the, you have to be a member in order to participate in discussions, in order to start a blog, in order to, to publish um, within the network. But it's also openly readable um, by anyone who comes along on the internet. So oh. it's, it's a way that our members can start thinking about how they're working together in order to get their work out mm -hmm. to the world um, while maintaining a certain sense of um, the, the, the members of the MLA as as a community of practice, um, working together with one another. And I think one of the suggestions this morning when you mm -hmm. were talking about this was that somehow other societies could tap in to the same commons idea, maybe even use the MLA commons and 
Yes, I absolutely. I refer to it as the possible the House of Commons. Of right, <laughs> it's very funny. We are in the process right now of, of, of beginning the, the planning phase um, mm -hmm. for the expansion of MLA Commons into what we're thinking of, at least at first, as the Humanities Commons. Um, working with a number of other scholarly societies who are interested in establishing their own proprietary commonses for their memberships, mm -hmm. but but working in a federated model where, for instance, a member of the American Historical Association, for instance, might be able to log into AHA commons, use resources there that are specifically mm -hmm. for AHA members, but collaborate with a member of the mm -hmm. MLA in a joint group or a joint project. Um, so we're, we're, like I say, in the very early stages of planning this, we've got about eight or 10 societies that are really interested mm -hmm. in pursuing this idea with us. Mm -hmm. And we're hoping once we get the first round of, of um, sort of technological and and governance mm -hmm. type specifications in place um, for for the broader humanities commons to be able to open up that federation model even further mm -hmm. and think about how um, those various spaces in which scholars are communicating with one another online might fruitfully link up, um, right. providing them with a sort of central identity um, management mm -hmm. system for themselves in their professional yeah. profiles. It strikes me that libraries could play a real substantial role in discoverability. Absolutely. Of this, of this kind of Absolutely. And we would love, again, this is another one of those places that would be ripe for collaboration mm -hmm. with libraries, mm -hmm. is to think about um, what kinds of metadata are already available in a network like this and what we should be capturing that we're not, mm -hmm. um, and how that metadata can be used to make this, this work even mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. um, discoverable, as you say. I just think this is really a revolution in scholarship itself. Yeah. It really will be. I, I believe that it will. I believe that it will. I think, um, you know, somebody asked me a while back how you would know when a network like MLA Commons or like Media Commons mm -hmm. um, had really come of age. When would you right. consider it a success? And for me, I, I really believe that, that a network like this will come of age at the point when scholars begin to do things with it that we could never have expected. Right? When they mm -hmm. really start yeah. kind of making it their own mm -hmm. in some very fundamental way. Um, and um, I'm hopeful that that will come soon. Mm -hmm. I think so. there'll be plenty of Prizes too. Yeah, indeed. Things that we haven't even anticipated indeed. that people will, will come up with. And that creativity factor is, is something you cannot underestimate. Absolutely. Uh, getting back to peer review, mm -hmm. uh, do you think that the open peer review that you've talked about, which oftentimes is going to be, uh, I guess it, it's, it's pre publication because it's not formally published or is it post-publication? It, you know, it, again, this is one of the challenges about about the nature of what publication is. If the open review is genuinely open, you have made the document public, right. and therefore has it been published mm -hmm. or has it not? Um, sometimes that, the, you know, the, I mean, as with mine, as with my book, um, there is a, re a revision process that takes place mm -hmm. after the review, mm -hmm. and the thing that is the final object is comes after the review right. process. So it is pre-publication in that sense. And uh -huh. yet, yeah. you know, the, the thing is still out there. And so it's, I mean, it's a challenge for thinking about the nature of what pre and post publication would be, I think. I guess really the, the question is regarding techniques like this for mm -hmm. peer review, as well as alt metrics, which I think you mentioned in your, in yes, your presentation yes. this morning. Are they adequate substitutes for the traditional peer review that most people are accustomed to? You know, I don't, Mm. Are they adequate substitutes? I'm not sure I'm, I'm interested in or pursuing the wholesale replacement of traditional peer review with this new model because I think um, as somebody described it to me just the other day is it's it, 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 peer review we think of it as being a system it's really less a system than a tool mm -hmm. um, and and sometimes you need a hammer and sometimes you need a screwdriver and neither is really a substitute for the other at the right moment um, so I, I think that um, again different communities different disciplines different kinds of, of scholarly work um, mm -hmm. will require different different approaches mm -hmm. to review right. um, in order to understand um, what what the significance of a particular kind of text is. Altmetrics, um, I think, are a sort of different, um, what to say of altmetrics? I think, I think altmetrics provide a really robust substitute for the kinds of ranking and evaluation of scholarly work post-publication that have traditionally mm -hmm. taken on things like 
journal impact factor mm -hmm. or yes. um, relative prestige of a press, mm -hmm. um, because those those alt metrics do a much more robust job of attempting to uncover what actually happens to something after it's mm -hmm. been published, right? right? Where is it cited? Um, how is it commented on? How much does it get tweeted? You know, where is right. it linked to around the internet and so forth? And those kinds of things, I think, have the potential to tell us a whole lot about the life of scholarship after it's been published. Mm -hmm. um, again, I don't think it's a substitute mm -hmm. for review for peer review at all, but I do think um, it, it can tell us something about scholarly impact um, in, in a way that we haven't been told mm -hmm. that before. Do you think it will eventually replace the impact factor? Oh, goodness, I hope so. <laughs> I really, really do. Um, quite frankly, I think impact factor has done tremendous, tremendous damage um, to the ways that scholarly work is evaluated, particularly at the mm -hmm. moment of promotion and tenure mm -hmm. reviews. Um, because it is, is, it is I, I'm just going to go ahead and be blunt and say this, it is a reductive measure mm -hmm. that assumes that knowing, that one can know the quality of a journal as a whole, mm -hmm. as opposed to the quality of any particular piece of scholarship. It sort of, um, um, it replaces understanding what a scholar's work has been with understanding where mm -hmm. it has been. And the where doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. help us to really think about what the role um, of that scholar's work in changing its right. field has been. We still seem so. wedded to this notion of the seminal journal. Right, mm -hmm. exactly, exactly. And I think I think more and more um, scholars are beginning to recognize that, that moving away from that fixation with what the good journals to publish in mm -hmm. are and what the less good ones are, um, the more they can figure out exactly who it is they want to be in communication mm -hmm. with and why um, at any yeah. given moment, so. One thing I noticed in, in one of your recent blogs, you indicated that you felt folks needed to take some time out every once in a while. Yes. <laughs> and I was wondering, have you done that for yourself while you were here in Charleston? I have not yet, oh, no. um, but I am about to. Okay. I am about to. I'm going to go yeah. take a walk. The weather looks gorgeous. Oh, this um, is and city. this is my first Great trip town. to Charleston, oh, really? so I'm really looking forward to getting out oh, and seeing just, a bit more. Just walk south toward the peninsula. Yeah, oh, uh, fantastic. I will do it. Just walk down King Street all the way down to the Excellent. peninsula. Excellent. That's Beautiful day to do it. And then walk down Wonderful. around the battery. Beautiful place. Very nice. Yeah. I will do that. Uh, one last thing, and this is, yes. I guess it's not quite a trick question, but in a sense maybe it is. Um, if you were sitting in Jack and my chair, huh. what would you ask yourself? Wow. <laughs> That's a really good question. <laughs> and I haven't a clue. What would I ask myself? <laughs> um, I probably would have focused a lot on the peer review thing because that that has been one of the places mm -hmm. of um, I don't know if I want to say controversy controversy mm -hmm. but um, but difference in mm -hmm. the work that I've done. Um, I might want to know a little bit more about. Um, about seeing the world of scholarly communication from the other side, right? I mean, I had a 13-year career as a faculty member, okay. and you know, five years as a graduate student mm -hmm. before that. I had, you know, published a couple of books and journal articles and all of mm -hmm. that kind of thing, and now suddenly find myself having done all this writing about scholarly communication in the role of attempting to create mm -hmm. um, a new mode of scholarly right. communication for an established organization. Um, it has been a big change um, to to come in and be thinking about um, about an organization and its needs mm -hmm. um, from the inside rather than from the side of of the members. On the other hand, I mean, when I was when I was a faculty member, I also chaired my department, and mm -hmm. you know, I was involved. I was on our faculty executive council, and you know, so I I was um, something of a systems builder on the administrative side of my faculty life, mm -hmm. uh, and so sort of making the change over to this this more purely administrative work um, as a publisher mm -hmm. and a facilitator of scholarly conversations um, has been. I don't know. It's it's been exciting. Mm -hmm. So. So it's wearing the two hats. It is. Yes. It is indeed. Okay. Kathleen, thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you. Really thank you. We really enjoyed My it. My pleasure. And we've learned a lot.